Welcome everybody to this extra special standards webcast. Um, the uh, topic is uh, Countdown to History, 100 Years of SMPTE Standards Development. Now, some of you may, may know that we normally hold our webcasts on Thursday, so uh, you may be asking yourself, uh, why Wednesday for this one? Well, today is a uh, historic day in Simti's, uh, well, Simti's existence. A uh, hundred years ago today, Simti was uh, incorporated. So we thought that this would be an appropriate day to have this particular webcast. And I want to thank uh, Mark Shubin for making sure that we knew which day it was. I am your host, Joel Welch, uh, Simti's Director of Education. Uh, I am going to turn on my webcam for just a little bit. Um, if this is your first time with SMPTE Standards Update webcast, they are a series of one-hour online webcasts. This one we publicized as being 90 minutes long, so there's going to be some extra information and some extra time today. Um, I'm going to go away now and uh, turn the floor over to um, our speakers, Howard Luck, Merrill Weiss, Michael Dolan, and Mark Shubin. And uh, Howard, uh, you should have control, and the floor is yours. Oh boy, I do love having control. Um, so welcome everybody um, to our uh, standards update of the last 100 years. Uh, um, I'm excited. This is uh, two big things going on. One is football is going to start, yay! And today is the hundredth anniversary uh, of SEMPTE of the incorporation of SEMPTE. So. Happy birthday to us, happy birthday to us, happy birthday, a whole standards community in SEMPTE, happy birthday to us, and uh, especially out to all those volunteers that are out there helping make these standards possible. I, I really thank you and, and uh, really uh, we're uh, very appreciative of the work that you do. So what we did running into this, we have some fantastic speakers coming up. Uh, we have uh, Merrill Weiss, a uh, SEMPTE fellow. We have Mark Shubin, another SEMPTE fellow. And we have Mike Dolan going to join us at the very end of it because um, he's uh, quite a busy man these days uh, to talk about Time Text, another SEMPTE fellow. So uh, it's a SEMPTE fellows party here today. What I did before we got this started, uh, it just last week, we did a survey of the standards community that's uh, over 780 people and counting uh, that participate in help make our standards. Um, and we did a survey of what would be the top 10 standards that we had in the last 100 years. So um, without further ado, oh, I'm skipping here, let's run through the top 10 before we uh, bring on the speakers to talk about all those wo lovely topics that we've done. So as the program goes on, you'll find that we don't talk about each one of these that made the top 10, but we talked about the most important ones that our speakers want to talk about. So I think you're going to find it exciting and entertaining all at the same time. So number 10, um, IMF, yay! Yay, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, came in at number 10. Maybe it'll grow uh, in the next 100 years. Uh, the next one is number 9, the DCDM. Boy, um, that one was a tough one to get done, uh, and those that were there around there would know about that. Number 8, of course, uh, composite video. Uh, what will we do without NTSC? It kind of started it all here in the Americas, if you will. Uh, and then uh, for number seven, we had uh, MXF. Boy, that's a very, very important one. I'm um, so glad to see it came in at number seven. Uh, and number six, HD, 1920 That was a big one, uh, and we're still uh, uh, really much in the HD world, moving to UHD. Uh, number five, it looks like... Uh, it was EG1. We have an engineering guideline. Yay! Made it into the top 10, so that's awesome. Uh, this is uh, color bars, basically. Uh, so that's a, a big one, and uh, it's pretty ubiquitous now throughout the world. And coming in number four, um, SDI, not SDI, but component video, 444, 422. Um, this was a, a really interesting one to get together, and Merrill's going to talk about that further on in our program today. Uh, and coming in at number three, uh, SDI, very, very important. Again, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that one as well, too. So um, let's see what number two comes out to be. Uh, of course, the first standard, uh, and we uh, 
we're going to have Mark Stuben talk about that stuff. So uh, what is the number one standard that came out of our survey of the past 100 years? Time code, of course, uh, is still around. Uh, it's, it's been around for quite some time, recently updated in 2014. We're still talking about time code. So that is, ladies and gentlemen, your top 10 standards of the day. And now what I'd like to do is turn it over to Mr. Shubin, who is coming to us live from Colorado. Even on his vacation, he still helps us out. So, Sempty fellow Mark Shubin, I'm going to let you take it away here and uh, talk about the origins of SMPE, not SMPTE, and our first standards. Okay, thanks very much, Howard. Um, as uh, both Joel and Howard mentioned, this is the 100th anniversary of the incorporation of SIMPI, but there are lots of 100th anniversary dates associated with SIMPI, and uh, perhaps the first one is what's shown on here, which was the first meeting, and that was on July 14th, and was covered in all the papers. Um, it's interesting that it was covered in all the papers, even though, according to the best information we have, there were a total of 11 people who showed up. Um, and you can tell from the first meeting that standards were very important. So uh, Henry Hubbard, who was the secretary of the National Bureau of Standards, was the keynote speaker. But there was another speaker who was from the patent office and another speaker from George Washington University who talked about standardization by research methods. So why was there all this interest in standards? Organization. Well, uh, Charles Francis Jenkins, our founder and first president, was active in both motion pictures and television even in the 19th century. In 1894, he may have been the first person to provide a movie projector, he called it a fantascope, um, that showed pictures to an audience. And in the same year, 1894, he published a diagram of a television camera. Uh, that he was hoping that uh, could be gotten to work. Well, after um, that period in the 19th century, motion pictures really started to take off at the beginning of the 20th century, and Thomas Edison owned most of the patents, and so he sort of created de facto standards, except he wanted to get money associated with his de facto standards. And um, so people who didn't want to abide by his standards would intentionally pick a different aspect ratio or a different film width or a different way of perforating the film so that uh, things could be uh, done outside of his patents. Eventually, his licensing system became the Motion Picture Patents Company, and it en encompassed many of the American producers and distributors, um, but it didn't encompass everyone. There were independents who still got their product from overseas, um, and so there was kind of a big mess. and. Um, here are two charts that are published by the uh, British Kinematograph Sound and Television Society, and you can just see from these various negatives and positives all of the different aspect ratios and film sizes and perforations uh, that were used. And I say all advisedly, there were uh, actually more than are shown on these charts. So there needed to be some form of standardization uh, to get the industry going. By the way, the year before SIMPI was incorporated in 1915, the Motion Picture Patents Company lost an antitrust lawsuit. And uh, when their appeal failed, they just dissolved. So uh, Jenkins was hoping to create standards, and uh, the Society of Motion Picture Engineers was born. And after the incorporation, one of the first tasks was to create a standardization committee. And uh, the standardization committee uh, came out with a series of standards in 1917, and they were published in the transactions. Transactions is what preceded the SIMTI journal. And it was uh, basically a complete list of standards, the uh, location of the frame line relative to the sprockets, the frame the film size, the sprocket size and shape, and so on. 
And the very first standard, uh, just in terms of what was printed, was for film speed. And the film speed was 60 feet per minute. And based on the size of the frame and uh, the number of sprockets and so on, uh, that worked out to 16 frames per second. And that was the shooting speed. Now, it turns out that the projection speed was a little different. Um, we look at silent films today, and we see everyone moving around very fast. And so we say, oh, that's wrong. That's not the way it was seen in the old days. But it is the way it was seen in the old days. The projectionists tended to project at rates that were faster than the shooting speed, uh, reduced the flicker for one thing, but it also allowed them to have more shows. Now, in the first run cinemas, they would uh, have a slightly slower speed, and in the independent cinemas, they would tend to have a faster projection speed so they could cram in even more shows. So let's talk about a, um, another characteristic, 24 frames per second, which uh, we uh, know and theoretically love today. Uh, it was introduced by Vitaphone. And a lot of people say, well, it was introduced for sound quality, because if you recorded sound on film, um, then if you ran at 16 frames per second, it wouldn't give you a high enough sound quality. But in fact, the Vitaphone system was a dual system. Uh, there was sound on phonograph records, and the picture was on film. So there was no relationship between the uh, film speed and the sound quality. Um, now, the Fox case system uh, also adopted 24 frames per second, but it was after the uh, case spawnable system had been at 85 feet per second, 24 frames per second is uh, 90 feet, uh, sorry, 90 feet per minute versus 85 feet per minute. And um, um, the 85 feet per minute was considered perfectly adequate for the sound quality, so 24 was not selected for sound quality. Um, Again, the sound quality based entirely on the disk system. By the way, the uh, Vitaphone disks were the first disks to use a 33 and a third RPM um, rotational speed. And here's how 90 feet per minute, or 24 frames per second, were chosen. Stanley Watkins, as you see at the left there, was from Western Electric. He knew he had to select a single speed because it wouldn't do for the film to be moving at different speeds. Uh, the sound would have wow and flutter and so on. Sam Warner was with him, um, and Walter Rich, who ran Vitaphone at the time. They were all in the projection booth with Warner Brothers' chief projectionist, Jack Keckley. And Watkins asked Keckley, um, so how fast do projectionists uh, run film? And he said, well, you know, anything from 80 to 90 feet per minute in the first run houses and anything from 100 feet per minute on up at the smaller houses. Um, and so he gave it a little thought. And we settled on 90 feet a minute as a reasonable compromise. And that's where 24 frames per second came from for 4 per 35 millimeter film. No visual perception reason, no sound perception reason, no engineering reason. It was just a compromise that was selected in that projection booth at that time. So now let's talk about that number one standard that uh, Howard was mentioning, time code, um, and why it's such an exciting thing. Um, I have mentioned the first the standards, which came out in 1917, they're not SIMPTI Standard 1. Uh, SIMPTI Standard 1 is actually assigned to two-inch quadruplex um, videotape, which came out in 1956. Now, when it came out in 1956, the thought was the main purpose that it had was um, simply to do a time zone delay for the West Coast. So East Coast stuff would uh, go out to the West Coast, it would be recorded, and it would be played back three hours later. 
but in 1958, there was a big show that was planned uh, for the DuPont show of the month. It was called The Red Mill. Uh, it had people in it like Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Um, really terrific project. And then, uh, this was going to be on CBS, uh, CBS's union technicians went on strike. And the producers were really concerned that the management people who were running things probably weren't going to be good enough to put this show on the air the way that it was expected to be seen. So they said, OK, let's record it in advance. But if we record it in advance, um, the guys are still not good enough to do the camera cuts at the right time and uh, maybe to pan at the right time. So they recorded each little segment of the show in advance and then they edited it into one videotape. Well, how did you edit videotape at the time? You took that two inch uh, wide piece of tape and you sloshed it in a solution of iron particles and the iron particles would align themselves uh, along the magnetic tracks and you could see where the uh, frame line was indicated and you would put this under a microscope and take a razor blade and cut between the magnetic lines on the tape and then splice another piece onto it. Well, for this program, uh, the Red Mill, there were more than 100 splices that were done. Some people say as many as 168 splices were done in this one 90-minute program. Uh, but it did air and it was successful. So after that, Ampex came up with a way of electronically editing videotape using something called Editech. And it would put a mark on the tape where you wanted it. And then if it turned out that that edit point was not exactly where you wanted it, there was a dial that you could use to adjust the number of frames that you want to go uh, before or after that mark was for the edit. But that was still pretty crude because you had to mark each edit individually and um, if you wanted to change that edit you had to find your edit point once again and uh, it was very difficult. Meanwhile, in places like NASA, there were people who were working with time code. Um, because they wanted to code when events were happening or when rocket engines should start or something like that. So SIPTI didn't invent time code and in fact the thing that you're seeing at the upper left is an ECO 900 time code controller for editing and it basically replaced the Ampex Editech uh, controller in a quadruplex machine but this time you could actually dial in a particular number uh, when you wanted an edit to happen and you could uh, dial in as you can see at the bottom left the stop time and at the bottom right the start time and um, change all kinds of things. Um, that was okay, but time code uh, didn't really lend itself perfectly to television. For one thing, we had already introduced color television and our frame rate changed from 30 frames per second to 29.97 frames per second. And so we had to somehow deal with uh, accommodating that and so um, there was something called drop frame time code that would drop the first two frames of every minute except every tenth minute and uh, that would allow clock time to match time code time uh, and so on. But using time code, at the right you see the Ampex RA4000, uh, RA for random access, uh, so you could go to wherever you wanted to make an edit and make the edit. And at the uh, bottom left you can see uh, CMX600 and one of those screens in front of the editor um, was actually a light pen touch screen and you could simply click off with the light pen where you wanted edits to happen and uh, there was a pile of disks and the disks had a 28 minute capacity and you could make your edit decisions on the CMX 600 and then take the edit decision list and use that to actually make the edits on the quadruplex video tape machines. And so this was a uh, tremendous uh, boon to um, how um, production would take place or post-production of video. 
So after we had the quadruplex machines, which could only produce a picture in normal play mode, not in um, stop mode or high speed or anything like that, um, people wanted to do something different. And in the 1970s, Ampex and Sony both introduced uh, videotape recorders. At the left is uh, Sony's version, the BVH-1000. And at the right is Ampex's version, the VPR-1. And uh, these were both used one inch tape. They both had a helical scan wrap around the head drum so that they uh, could produce a picture in stop motion or um, at high speed when you were shuttling, you could see something, not something you could broadcast. But the Ampex came up with a way of making something that you could broadcast by introducing something called auto track following um, that would eliminate the noise bars if you were in uh, what was called a, or what came to be called a stunt mode, um, non-play speed. And Sony had a different innovation that they had. In the Ampex system, there was a section of time of the video signal that simply wasn't recorded because there had to be a gap where the tape entered and left the head drum. Um, so Sony added an extra head, they called it a half a head, that basically recorded the sync. And Ampex had other ways of replacing the sync. Now these were two very, very different philosophies that they had. But the networks put their foot down and said, we are not going to uh, buy yet another of many, many different formats of videotape machines and have it be incompatible. We want something that can be interchanged. Now, the previous uh, SIMTI videotape standard, the quadruplex standard, was sort of a rubber stamping of what Ampex had done. But in this case, we have these two companies with two very different philosophies, and the networks are saying, well, you know, get it together, make it one. And so Fred Remley, uh, who was in charge of the necessary committees, uh, got everyone into the room and said, okay, you know, how are we going to modify your Sony and Ampex recorders so that you can still both keep the advantages that you have. So Sony, you can keep that extra half a head to uh, record the sync, and Ampex, you can keep that uh, automatic track following, but we've got to make a single standard out of this. And so they argued and they argued, and eventually they came up um, with the Type C standard. And that, I think, is one of the great accomplishments of SIMTI. And on that note, I will turn it over to uh, either Howard or Merrill to pick up the rest of the story. Ah, fascinating stuff, some of which uh, I actually uh, remember those old machines and tweaking those in my very junior uh, days as being an engineer working for Quad One Video. So fantastic stuff. Of course, the two-inch machine scared the crap out of me. So, oh, sorry, uh, this is a family show. I'll have to watch my language. So, Merrill, if you're up, yep. Yeah. Before, before we go to Merrill, um, we have a question. Can I ask it? Yeah, sounds good. Um, this, this is from Michael. Michael asks, um, is there any truth to the old urban legend that the origin of the CMX 600 was from the CBS side of the venture and that they wanted it to edit out all the violent scenes from Gunsmoke to be able to uh, market into, uh, mark into uh, syndication? It says, I remember the CMX 600 at... Uh, Teletronics two doors down from my office, lots of paper tape and flipping toggles on the DPD-8 that ran it. Uh, I can't talk to the editing out violent scenes in Gunsmoke because this is the first time that I've heard of that, but certainly the C of CMX was CBS and the MX was, uh, or the M was Memorex and X for Experimental, and uh, they did try to come up with the first nonlinear editing system or the first practical nonlinear editing system. And I see also that there was a comment from uh, Pat Waddell uh, that I should please say 30 divided by 1.001, not 29.97. My apologies, Pat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, take it away, Merrill, if you can, and uh, we'll move to, to that section. So NTSC uh, had been around for some time, in fact, 
since 1953 in terms of NTSC color, and since 1939, I guess, in monochrome. But it had always been defined in the FCC rules and in uh, in documents uh, that had been produced by uh, those outside of, of SIMTI. It was uh, the EIA, Electronics Industry Association, uh, had documented it uh, along with the FCC. Then in um, 1977, the FCC decided that there was too much uh, uh, freedom being taken with the requirements of the rules in terms of the blanking width, and that they started fining uh, television stations for having wide blanking or narrow images. And so that, that set off a scramble to fix the problem. Uh, the source of the problem turned out to be that there were cascaded time-based correctors, and it's a shame we're doing this first because the uh, digital video would have been good before this, but uh, I'll see if I can fit the two together here. Um, the time-based correctors uh, were the, probably the earliest devices that were commonly used in television stations, and they essentially sampled the video, converted analog to video, did some processing to um, fix the time-based inaccuracies or errors of the uh, largely umatic tape recorders initially. And then later uh, they, they moved into other kinds of machines, so like uh, quad machines and the like, and one-inch machines. Uh, but as, as they uh, did their processing, they would sample based on the blanking um, I'm sorry, based on the, the burst phase of the, of the color burst. And when they did that, then they would apply a new blanking on the output of the, of the device. Well, there was no, at the time, there was no specification of the relationship between the color burst phase and the, uh, and the sync pulse. And so the, the sampling was being done based on the, the, uh, the burst, but the blanking was being added based on the, the um, uh, sync pulse. And as a, as a consequence, the relationship was random from one, at least one facility to another, if not within a facility. And as a consequence, as blanking was added with each new generation of the, of the content, the, the blanking just kept chewing out more and more of the, um, of the actual content, and so you had a wider blanking, and, and the, the raster was not being filled with image. So the, the, the um, industrial version of the uh, NTSC standard was prepared by the Electronic Insta Industries Association, EIA, and they, they put together something called RS-170, which was written much earlier than uh, 1977 or even 1953, and covered uh, monochrome only. And so it was antiquated and obsolete at the point of uh, 1977. Uh, once we had these issues with uh, blanking and other, other aspects of uh, the signal, that were not standardized because color was not included, uh, the EIA spun up another effort to define a color operation of NTSC, and that uh, was done under the uh, RS-170 label, but with an A attached to it. And so people started talking about RS-170A. Uh, it was incorporated into what came to be called the Industrial Electronics Tentative Standard Number 1, and the, the, there was a, a, a diagram that went with that that was what was mostly known by, by people who were at the operational level, at least, and that was called RS-170A. Both of them were labeled as tentative standards or tentative documents. The, the diagram in particular included a, 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 a picture of the four-color field sequence that is 
uh, part of the NTSC color system. So it takes four fields before you get back to the same phase of sync and, and color information or burst um, in, and, and repeat the, the, um, the sequence. Time in the RS-170A of the relationship between the subcarrier and horizontal sync, which came to be called the SCH, SC hyphen, I'm sorry, uh, SC uh, fraction bar H um, as the abbreviation. So the SCH phase relationship was established. They, both, both those documents, RS-170 and RS-170A, were written to describe emitted signals, ones that got transmitted. The FCC rules had a similar uh, description of the emitted signals that came from the original NTSC documentation and material that was supplied by RCA when they developed the color system. None of it dealt with the studio requirements. So at, uh, at the point where the, uh, the problems were occurring, a SMPTE spun up an activity to try to uh, put together description of what was needed in the studio if you wanted to be able to create content that would emit well uh, over the NTSC system and help to fix a, a lot of the problems. So the requirements were things like easy conversion between analog and digital, between analog and digital or between digital and analog, uh, easy conversion between composite, that is NTSC, and components and vice versa, uh, a defined picture center to support production, and a tight SCH phase tolerance uh, for control of uh, blanking and, and management of the, of the uh, process. So SIMPTI developed uh, SIMPTI 170 uh, for the purpose of meeting all those requirements. I, w I would note that as soon as we started that effort, I got in touch with um, whoever was handing out the numbers in those days and reserved 170 so that we would have it available uh, to, uh, to match up with the, the 170 that everybody else knew from the RS-170 documents. One of the things that was different about uh, NTSC, I'm sorry, about the SMPTE, uh, S, what became ST-170, and the other definitions of NTSC were that the bandwidth of the color difference channels, whether they were I and Q minus Y, B minus Y, uh, were the same. Whereas in the system, the signal that was emitted, I and Q had different bandwidths, which was done in order to preserve uh, broadcast bandwidth, that the signal could fit in a narrower space, and that was based on the, the human visual system's need for uh, less bandwidth in, in, one, uh, in one dimension rather than the other, when you think about it in vector terms. Um, the uh, SMPTE 170 also uh, specified the image center for the first time in NTSC. Uh, we had started doing that in component video, and it seemed natural to do it for NTSC, but it turned out it was a fairly difficult uh, process of coming to agreement uh, because of the fact that the um, the center did, fell between pixels, and do you put it on a pixel, or do you put it uh, between pixels? Same thing happened in, uh, in uh, digital systems where we had even numbers of lines. Uh, the question was, do you put it on one of the lines, or do you, do you put it between lines? And the answer is you put it wherever the center of the image is so that you have equal numbers of pixels on both sides. So if, every, if there is an even number, it's between pixels. If there's an odd number, it's on one. Um, one other thing, the SCH phase tolerance was specified, but also the measurement points, which, which helped to um, uh, make it more useful. And th those standard, standardized white patterns would not have been possible before that. The, the new SMPTE standard also enabled control of blanking width through a, the precise application of SCH phases I've been describing. 
And in ENCODE enabled uh, two encoding methods, you could get to an NTSC output either by using YCBCR, which is what we were using for component uh, digital operation, or you could use YIQ. And the difference between those two was one of the differences between D1 tape recording and D2 tape recording. Uh, D1 being component ran on the Y C B C sub B C sub R scheme, uh, whereas D2 ran on Y I Q, and so it made it more difficult to go back and forth between D1 and D2 than it might have been if both of them had used the same uh, uh, the same um, signals, and so that ended up being simply 170 M originally, then it became SMPTE 170, and now today it's SMPTE ST 170. And that is the story about SMPTE and RS 170 and SMPTE, now SMPTE ST 170. This is the, um, the story that led to digital video. Uh, back in the, in the mid-70s, there was uh, the use of TBCs coming into into business, as I mentioned. Uh, the problem was that every time you used one, you had to convert from analog to digital, do your processing, and then convert from digital back to analog. And cascading those A to D and D to A processes was damaging to the image quality. So there was an effort made starting in 1977 to put together an interface standard to be able to connect uh, the, the digital signals together and not have to go back to analog. The, the initial work was on composite, that is NTSC video, and the great debate that took place was whether to operate at three times the color subcarrier frequency or four times the color subcarrier frequency for sampling. The, um, the trade-off was in the cost of memory and the cost of the A to D and D to A converters, A to D in particular. Eventually, uh, for FSC1, four times the subcarrier frequency one once the, the cost of the uh, components came down. And we got uh, as far as developing an almost complete standard. It was called the Red Book, and it was based on a parallel uh, interface with a DB25 connector. So you had 12 pairs and one ground wire uh, in that DB25 connector. And you'll see in a little bit what, how cumbersome that was, but it was essentially word serial bit parallel. During that time, the EBU had a, an effort going on on digital video coding. They were interested in international program exchange, trying to get PAL and CCAM back and forth. And so they recognized that Component was a good solution for trying to do that. And then in 1979, uh, start, there were discussions started to be sent between SMPTE and EBU. And ultimately, that led to uh, a joint effort to try to come up with a component uh, scheme that would work for both sets of needs, that is the 60 hertz world and the 50 hertz world. Ultimately, um, in about 1980, uh, EBU ran some demonstrations using 625 line systems, and SMPTE was responsible for doing demonstrations using 525. And that led then to the first, what were called the first demonstrations of component coded digital video. Uh, it turned out it was the only one that was conducted at KPI, KPIX in San Francisco in uh, 1981 during the week of the SMPTE Winter Conference, which was at the, I think it was the St. Francis Hotel there. Uh, I would note that that is the, the very same weekend that HDTV was publicly shown in the in uh, North America for the first time at the at the winter conference, uh, so a lot going on in San Francisco at uh, that time. So the demonstration used a studio at KPIX as essentially a research center, conducting subjective assessment using formalized methods from CCIR, and also providing demonstrations for attendees from around the world. I have all the original documentation from that, and recently I looked through it and did a count, and there were 330 people who were signed up for it, and it read like a who's who of anybody in the television industry 
uh, worldwide at that at that point. It included six essential experiments. We were looking at sampling frequency. Uh, we were looking at the picture coding hierarchies of 444, 422, and things like that. We looked at color matting, and I'll explain why. Uh, we were looking at going back and forth between component and composite, at uh, filtering, and also at digital tape recording. So with respect to sampling frequency, there were three values that were tried. One around 12 megahertz, which was of interest to uh, the Europeans, in particular the French. Uh, one at around 13 and a half megahertz, which turned out to be uh, related to a magic number. And one at about 14, uh, 14 actually I think it was closer to 14.2 mega, megahertz, so that we um, avoided being on the fourth, fourth multiple of the NTSC subcarrier, that wasn't the point. We were trying to indicate that that wasn't really what we were doing. And then the picture coding hierarchy, we tested all four of the levels, 444, 422, 411, and 211, all in YCBCR. In this case, the four was to say it was approximately equal to four times the, the color subcarrier. Uh, the Europeans had used a four, uh, f four, no, 14, 12, no, 12, 4, 4 nomenclature, which was the actual frequency that they were using. So essentially it was a 4, 1, 1 configuration with the luminance at about 12 megahertz. So in any event, that left us with a 12 point matrix of parameters to investigate. And we did so with three different configurations of the system. Uh, over here on the left, uh, you can see that we had picture sources where we were doing uh, direct sampling and feeding that to a monitor, or we could look at the picture source itself, or we could look through various kinds of converters. For instance, we could expand the picture horizontally, uh, or we can convert it back and forth to uh, uh, between analog and digital analog. And that, those are all then presented on a series of monitors in the CCIR 500 method that I was mentioning. Another one that we did was color matting, and that turned out to become very important. You'll see why in a little bit. Um, and there we had uh, direct sampling, and we had the digital converters that could be on one side and then uh, over the camera. And so that would be the foreground of the color mat. And then we could use uh, scan slides uh, for the background. And then finally, we could we could do the what we had over here on the left. We could do that through an NTSC encode and decode, which were done in analog, by the way, uh, so that we could see what happened when we looked through an NTSC window. And these are the kinds of pictures that we used. These were pretty standard in those days that we used for image sources, either for the foreground, just to look at the image itself, uh, or for the background when we were doing color matting and to sample what those looked like. Uh, here is a probably the first component uh, character generator that was um, uh, in use. And this is an off-screen image. You can see the moiré from the uh, image, uh, from sorry, from the uh, CRT display. Um, so a number of these are going to be off-screen images that you'll be seeing. Uh, here is an image that turned out to be extraordinarily important. If you look at the twisted crepe paper, you can see that when the paper is is uh, normal to the camera, you see what looks like a, uh, an ellipsoidal shape. When it's perpendicular to the camera, it essentially comes to a point. And as we went through looking at these images, and this was a foreground for use with the Ultimat, uh, as we went through looking at the images, those points, if you had enough information in the color difference channel, would stay pretty much as you see them there. When you had too little information, those points would pull apart. And it was very obvious. You, you wouldn't see it uh, viewing it directly, but you would see it through the ultimate that we had uh, uh, for that purpose. And so it became essentially the, the image that told the story in the end. And I'll show you the, the reasons why. So to take a look at, at the facility uh, experiments in the middle, uh, we had a multi-track audio recorder, but more important behind that over here, we have the, one of the first digital component 
prototype tape recorders in the world. That was brought by Sony, and they had uh, two decks there. We had other machines to be able to record. Importantly, and with a sad ending, we had an RGB tape recorder made up of three machines that uh, we specially modified so that they could record essentially monochrome signals but with high precision, so RG and B were monochrome, but then we could play them back through an editor and see what we had done. Unfortunately, those tapes have been, been lost to time. Um, to the control point, you might recognize somebody there. Then 1.85, 2.2, 2.35% uh, scope, and tried to figure out what the least loss of area would be for an image sensor, and that turned out to be 1.77, and uh, Joe Nadan at Phillips Labs had already proposed 16 to 9 for consumer sets, and that's 1.7777, and so that was very close, and so that's where 16 to 9 came from. But the problem is that was the wrong problem to be solved. It wasn't just an engineering problem of um, what should be the least amount of image sensor area uh, to be lost. And if you look at the right, this is from the uh, ASC uh, American Cinematographer Handbook, um, the seventh edition, I believe. And it's showing finder markings for different aspect ratios, 2.4, 2.2, 1.85. And they have different heights, but they all have the same sides. Now, why is that? Because in dramatic cutting or comedic cutting, you often want to cut when somebody enters or leaves the frame. And because gravity exists, uh, people tend to enter and leave the frame horizontally from the left side or the right side. And so you want to have common sides. And um, when Kearns Powers was made aware of this after the 16 to 9 aspect ratio had been developed, um, he uh, did a sort of public mea culpa at an NAB convention and said, uh, had I known of this, uh, we might have come up with something different. And this actually caused a rift between uh, SIMPTI and the uh, American Society of Cinematographers and the Directors Guild that took uh, some time uh, to be healed. And now I will turn it back over to Merrill. Thanks, Mark. And uh, boy, do I remember those, uh, those pain points during that time. 2.0 from the ASC, and it took a long time for the ASC and the SEMPTI to kind of warm back up together again, and that happened uh, luckily during the digital cinema standard. So Merrill, if you're ready, uh, please uh, join in. So Mark was talking a little bit about politics and being involved. Uh, it's not all the time, but there are times when the tech of politics enters into the development of SEMPTI uh, standards. The serial digital interface, the original one, is, is one of those cases. Uh, the working group on digital video standards, so sorry, studio video standards, which had succeeded the original work, uh, working group, held a meeting at Limelight Studios in Miami, uh, which was the first fully digital operation that was based on those TV25 connectors that I mentioned, and had T1 recorders and all the other gear to make a complete post-production suite, and when we got there, uh, Marcos Obadiah, who was the guy who put it together, uh, showed us a, a shallow blue wash coming from a graphics generator, and the, um, the, the first thing you saw was that there was contouring, uh, so it, it meant that we had not put enough bits into the 8-bit uh, interface to, to be able to completely render the, the uh, image the way it was desired to do, do so. And the impact was immediately recognizable, and unfortunately it was a condition we hadn't been able to demonstrate in San Francisco, so we had no idea that was coming. 
Well, in the case of SMPTE 240, it was in the opposite direction. People were concerned about Japan having a lead over the United States in high technology, and so the State Department really wanted to push through this standard that changed the system from what Japan was doing. And so they and some other forces were saying, we need to make this standard right away. But other people said, hmm, this is not such a good standard. And it is, to the best of my knowledge, the only SIMTI standard that was opposed at the American National Standards Institute. In fact, the ANSI uh, rejected the SIMTI standard. Uh, and it was only a SIMTI standard and not American national standard. The third principle is one that Bill Miller sometimes talks about. Uh, you get the standards you deserve. Oops, let me back up there. Um, so on the left side of this image, you can see some of the work that was done in the SIMTI uh, working group on high definition electronic production on coming up with the aspect ratio. And they looked at all of the various possible distribution aspect ratios, 1.33, 1.67, 1.85, 2.2, 2.35 uh, per cinemascope, and tried to figure out what the least loss of area would be for an image sensor. And that turned out to be 1.77. And uh, Joe Nadan at Phillips Labs had already proposed 16 to 9 for consumer sets. And that's 1.7777. And so that was very close. And so that's where 16 to 9 came from. But the problem is that was the wrong problem to be solved. It wasn't just an engineering problem of um, what should be the least amount of image sensor area uh, to be lost. And if you look at the right, this is from the uh, ASC uh, American Cinematographer Handbook, um, the seventh edition, I believe. And it's showing finder markings for different aspect ratios, 2.4, 2.2, 1.85. And they have different heights, but they all have the same sides. Now, why is that? Because in dramatic cutting or comedic cutting, you often want to cut when somebody enters or leaves the frame. And because gravity exists, uh, people tend to enter and leave the frame horizontally from the left side or the right side. And so you want to have common sides. And um, when Kearns Powers was made aware of this after the 16 to 9 aspect ratio had been developed, um, he uh, did a sort of public mea culpa at an NAB convention and said, uh, had I known of this, uh, we might have come up with something different. And this actually caused a rift between uh, SIMTI and the uh, American Society of Cinematographers and the Directors Guild that took uh, some time uh, to be healed. And now I will turn it back over to Merrill. Thanks, Mark. And uh, boy, do I remember those, uh, those pain points during that time. 2.0 from the ASC, and it took a long time for the ASC and the SEMTI to kind of warm back up together again, and that happened, uh, luckily, during the digital cinema standard. So, Merrill, if you're ready, uh, please uh, join in. So, Mark was talking a little bit about politics and being involved. Uh, it's not all the time, but there are times when the techno politics enters into the development of SEMTI uh, standards. The serial digital interface, the original one, is, is one of those cases. Uh, the working group on digital video standards, so sorry, studio video standards, which had succeeded the original work, uh, working group, held a meeting at Limelight Studios in Miami, uh, which was the first fully digital operation that was based on those TV25 connectors that I mentioned, and had T1 recruiters and all the other gear to make a complete post-production suite, and when we got there, uh, Marcos Obadiah, who was the guy who put it together, uh, showed us a, a shallow blue wash coming from a graphics generator, and the, um, the, the first thing you saw was that there was contouring, uh, so it, it meant that we had not put enough bits 
into the 8-bit uh, interface to, to be able to completely render the, the uh, image the way it was desired to do, do so. And the impact was immediately recognizable and unfortunately it was a condition we hadn't been able to demonstrate in San Francisco so we had no idea that was coming. At the, um, the meeting we worked out how to do a 10-bit parallel interface and as soon as we got home there was unhappiness coming from our uh, colleagues in Europe about changing that standard and it started a series of debates about adding noise in the form of dithering to the signal in order to eliminate the effects of the contouring and we had papers being given and, and the like. The working group though saw that there were other other issues that came from the 8-bit limitations. We had a number of demonstrations uh, including fader arms, stepping and, and the like that uh, became possible as as uh, various companies were developing uh, equipment to be able to build component digital uh, facilities. The, at the same time, the parallel interfaces were cumbersome. Uh, you saw what one looked like. Uh, you really wouldn't want to build too many facilities with that. And so there was a real push on to develop a, a single coax interface and be able to um, use the, the existing infrastructure to the extent possible. First serial interface, and I say first, and you'll see why in a minute, uh, was developed using coding that converted 8-bit uh, bit signals into 9-bit signals and then serialized them. So there was a lookup table that did that conversion. Uh, it was done in a way that you flip the, uh, the order of the bits uh, or the, the phase of the bits each time you use a particular code and then that allowed you to eliminate DC and to minimize the number of octaves that the, the uh, bandwidth of the signal took and permitted then using equalization of cables which you had to do to get that kind of bandwidth into uh, into coax. With that system developed the, there were chips promised within a year from a particular company and two years later there were still no chips. So with that as, as um, background, well there was one other issue actually. The, if you took nine bits and you, re and you multiplied it by 27 mega samples per second, you got 243 megabits per second. Well that resulted in a fundamental frequency of 121.5. Anybody who is a pilot or a board, uh, does uh, boating will know that frequency. It's a primary international distress frequency and 243 mega, megahertz is a secondary and so there was potential for interference and in fact the interference did occur uh, at the Bosch Transy laboratory near Frankfurt Airport and every plane that was coming in was having its emergency locator receiver going off. Uh, it turned out to be a parallel interconnection but it caused industry worry nonetheless. So with that as background, uh, there was a, um, a concept brought by Peter Dare and Takeo Iguchi of Sony um, who had an alternate scheme for a serial digital interface based on non-return to zero inverted or NRZI. And their proposal uh, operated with 8 bits in and 8 bits out so eight times the sample rate got you to 216 megabits per second and if you were running CCIR 601 kinds of sample rates and the problem was they didn't under, they didn't know how they should introduce it to SMPTE given that we already had a, a solution that had been uh, had been documented and so the question was asked what's the maximum operating speed of your second semiconductor process? And the answer was 240. And so then follow-up question, could you go to 300 or greater? And the answer was yes. And next question, how long? And the answer, six months. So, okay, come back in six months 
and will tell you what to do for 300, you know, when you can handle 300 megabits. Six months later, they were back, and the plan was operate at 10 bits at 270 megabits for component digital and operate again at 10 bits uh, uh, amplitude spaced at both 143 and 177 megabits per second for composite and put that all on the same chip. And if we got that result, and ultimately we did, then it solved about four problems, uh, several of which were techno-political. One, it provided a route to 10-bit operation. We wouldn't have to standardize the 10-bit interface. It, will be, it would be inter internal to the equipment, but we could have a 10-bit serial interface. It also meant that we would get chips available relatively quickly since they still were not coming from anywhere else for 8B, 9B. And it overcame the issues of 243 megabits. And at the same time, it avoided replacing 8B, 9B coding. That was still available for 8-bit SDI if somebody wanted to do it. So we wouldn't cause at least direct loss of face for the supporters of the 8B, 9B scheme. There were some unintended consequences. Uh, it was possible to generate pathological signals, which are long runs of ones and zeros. Takeo Iguchi, to his credit, pointed that out in Simply Papers. The other thing, the other unintended consequence was that it facilitated D2 uh, DVTRs and composite digital equipment, which became for some years a diversion from moving to fully component digital operations. Uh, which ultimately we would need in order to do a, a digital image compression. But we didn't know that at the time, so that we went ahead down that path. And it, it probably made the transition to digital operation happen quicker, but it was a, a bit of a sidetrack. Empty time text. This is uh, relatively new. You've been hearing a lot about uh, uh, from 100 years ago up until uh, a little bit ago. Um, Simply Time Text, on the other hand, was developed in the 2010-2013 time frame. And this is the authoring and distribution format for the encoding and carriage of closed captions and subtitles over the internet. And um, this, is, uh, this came about, well, first of all, it's based heavily on uh, Time Text uh, TTML out of W3C. And uh, TTML is extended to support uh, TV and caption specific metadata and also image formats that uh, um, are able to, to uh, do graphics based rather than text based. Um, caption distribution is somewhat complicated. Um, it, it follows uh, to a great degree, of course, the video and audio, but a lot of times the, the uh, captioning will take place um, sometimes even uh, physically not co-located to the video and audio. And so the distribution diagram here looks sort of a bit of a spider web, um, and particularly when you start considering broadcast television versus um, uh, broadcast television versus over the Internet delivery. Next slide, please. So uh, broadband distribution of the media content has increased and become much more mainstream. And, and this is, was true even in 2010, uh, but it's certainly the case that it's uh, uh, become even more so with uh, Netflix and Amazon and Google and all of these organizations that are providing um, relatively high quality media delivery over the internet or over the top. Um, but most of them have been using the proprietary, in fact, almost all of them, media formats, including the formats for captions. So uh, broadly deployed formats such as 608 and 708 were not really designed for Internet delivery. Uh, they were a binary format that uh, had was bind tightly to uh, television signals in some cases. So I mentioned a couple of these. Uh, but a bunch of companies got together uh, as early as 2007 trying to put their heads around this. Uh, AOL, Google, Microsoft, WGBH, NCAM, which is the uh, accessibility and captioning group there at WGBH in Boston, um, and Yahoo, they formed an internet captioning forum. <clears throat> and I think the, um, I think the uh, 
link is probably still good, although honestly I haven't checked it lately. But they, the organization was part of getting Simpty Time Text off the ground. It concluded early that an industry standard was needed to ensure interoperability and widespread adoption, the same reason you do any standard, of course. And they submitted a proposal to Simpty. Next slide, please. So uh, in reaction to that, in 2008, Simpty formed a new group. Um, members from all parts of the distribution chain for closed captioning, including content providers, computer IT folks, caption service providers, broadband distributors, equipment vendors, and basic accessibility experts. Uh, and a liaison was set up with a coalition of organizations for accessible technology. Um, so we had a pretty close relationship with them. And um, we wanted to try to do a broad core standard uh, with some application specific recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, as a result of all that and pulling together these standards for the end result, sort of skipping to the, an the answer here, um, W3C published a recommendation in 2010 called TTML or the Time Text Markup Language. And so we built on top of that, uh, constrained it a bit, and also extended it to do some specific things to carry 608 and 708 metadata. Um, this slide's a little out of date in that these are all 2013 standards these days. And uh, there's the RP that covers the transformation from 608 into this current text format. And uh, there's a 2052-11, which um, uh, deals with the CEA 708 conversion in the empty time text. Um, so after this occurred, the FCC was trying to put their arms around, well, okay, we've got this uh, problem. We need some captioning on there. There were a number of different people at that point now starting to promote uh, their ways of doing it uh, or something similar to their ways of doing it in the silos that had been developed over that time period. Um, but in the end, uh, the FCC said, well, you need to meet these set of requirements, and there's a reg you can go look at for all the details. Um, but if you do simply time text, then it's in what's called a safe harbor. And that says that you can do it any way you want, but if you do it this way, you're guaranteed not to get into trouble. Next slide, please. Oh, we, now we're up to the next one. So let me say a few other words on, on closing here, and then we can get back to Merrill. Um, since this occurred, the, the work in SMPTE has is, is tapered off since 2013. Um, SMPTE contributed all the extensions that it did for SMPTE time text, along with some requirements that were coming out of IMS at the time uh, for theatrical release uh, content as opposed to television content. And both of these are using SMPTE time text. So if you look at the IMS standard, the core uh, pieces of the applications, you'll find that SMPTE time text is, is in there. Um, we gave all this to W3C and said, look, we did all these extensions and everything. We'd really like it if on the next uh, spin of this, uh, you got all these empty extensions in there so it's more broadly accessible to people outside of the industry that Simpty serves. And they did that. Um, and in parallel, um, so they're working on a TTML2. Um, and in parallel, um, another organization gave W3C a set of uh, features and constraints to to constrain it to basically the 708 functionality. And um, as a result of that, they produced something called IMSC1, which is a profile of TTML. And that is roughly uh, empty time text today uh, that was created not only out of Simpty's input, but also ultraviolet, the digital uh, DECE. And, um, a lot of work at W3C to try to get that to align. Another relevant piece of this is that there's a subset of IMSC1 that's being used by the EBU and in experimental uh, work and also some production work in Europe uh, called EBU TTD. And so that's worth noting. It's a strict subset of IMSC1 and also compatible with Simpty Time Text. Um, and I guess the final thing that's worth mentioning here is that in January of this year, the Academy Awards, uh, uh, sorry, Emmy Awards were uh, given to Simpkey and some others for the development and deployment of um, time-based text for the internet and specifically Simpkey time text. 
So, that's it. Thank you, Mike. That's fantastic. And uh, Merrill, if you want to take control again one more time and talk about EBU. Okay, so in the um, mid-90s, it was recognized that the move to digital operation was going forward at a rapid pace and that as, as the industry turned fully digital, the way we did our business was going to change and was going to need to change. And so the, the uh, European Broadcasting Union and SIMTI got together again with a, with a task force, the original work that led to uh, SIMTI 125 had been a task force. So what was set up was a, a task force for the, on harmonization of standards, a real long name I won't read, uh, it essentially it amounted to 200 engineers from all over the place or over uh, close to two years meeting 18 times with the objective of setting the direction for the industry for a decade or two and, and really creating a road map. Uh, this slide is wrong. It should be 18 years now. We're on, on the road map and still going in the direction that the, that the task force set. So it gives you some measure of the success of what we've done uh, or what we did with that group. Concepts like content equals essence plus metadata came out of it. And the idea of essence alone came, came out of the task force uh, of various types. And of course, metadata being bits about the bits of essence and it could be either parameters or descriptions. Uh, just to give you an idea, there was a whole range of, of activities that were covered or aspects of the, of the business ranging from, from systems to interconnection options, uh, how you think about time, uh, compression, uh, wrappers and metadata. So MXF, for instance, grew out of the work of the task force. Uh, both as a wrapper and using metadata. It also built on a, another SIMPTI standard that had been developed uh, around that time or just prior to the time of the task force, which was universal labels that ended up being the, the foundation for the KLV metadata and even going forward into XML. Uh, the, the identification scheme uses the universal label approach. And the task force went on and looked at networks and transfer protocols and all of the infrastructure that would be needed to move from a raster-based system to a world of, of compression and also to move from everything having to be in real time to being able to use files and workflows. Uh, all of that is covered in, in two reports that were produced by the, the task force that uh, were in the SIMPTI journal, so you can still find them online uh, through IEEE Explorer. And they very much set the, the foundation for where we are today and the direction we're heading uh, in terms of the, that change in the, the whole structure of the, the work of the business. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Thanks, Merrill. And Thanks for wrapping it up. Uh, Joel, let's turn the control back over to you. And maybe you can flip us down to the very final page of the deck and open up for Q&A. And uh, I really want to thank my panelists here. Uh, they've all done a fantastic job. They all have day jobs. So they, they slid this in right in between all the rest of the work they're going. And it's quite a busy time. So again, thanks, Merrill, uh, Michael, and, uh, and Mark for uh, being able to contribute to this day. And let's open it up for questions. And thank you, Howard. Um, I'd like to uh, invite our guests to uh, post questions. Again, verbal questions are good. We'll take you first. And uh, text questions uh, are okay. We'll take those um, afterwards. Um, we do have a couple of um, a couple of comments and a, and a question. Um, one from good friend uh, Andy. He uh, I think it goes back to when Merrill was speaking. He said only four fields. Ha. He says, us poor PAL people have uh, eight or had eight fields. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Philip says, uh, quad machine lockup also could add blanking successively to one side. 
depending on H phase settings and probability. I think that's when you were talking, Mark. And let's see, Gene asks, and I'll be interested to see how, how you respond. Gene says, uh, Mr. Schneider in 1958 was the chief editor at NBC Burbank at the time who actually homemade, uh, yeah, who actually homemade time code for editing for the special An Evening with Fred Astaire. Wouldn't he be the father of time code? Didn't that become the eventual Simpty time code? And feel free, any of, the, of our panelists, to kind of chime in there. Uh, well, uh, this is Mark, and I don't know, uh, but I would be delighted to look into it. Uh, this is Merrill. I, I believe that IRIG time code uh, was in use uh, well before that, and uh, as Mark was describing for missile, missile launches and things of that nature, uh, ECO was one of the first companies to get into that. Uh, realm, and I think they came out of the IRIG world. Uh, but in terms of SMPTE time code and whether that's a precursor or predecessor, no, I, I can't speak to. Yeah, and IRIG takes me back. I worked out at NASA for quite some years, and we all had IRIG time code that we had to eventually get locked into SMPTE time code as well. So IRIG doesn't count frames, it counts seconds, milliseconds, et cetera, for scientific. But uh, great, great stuff, guys. Uh, next question from Rick. Uh, would you be able to share briefly the next five runner-up standards that didn't make the top ten? Oh boy, it, it, you're, you're making me uh, pull my data, which I don't have right in front of me. But um, we had 25 in there. The runner-ups were um, a little bit more generic. We got to BXF was in there. We got some uh, other MXF standards, I believe, got in there. Um, more VTRs, two inch versus one inch. There's those type of things. So um, on the survey, we had 25 to select from, and then a lot of people suggested some things that I had forgotten about as well too. So, you know, um, there's some RPs. The 177 was an interesting one. Um, so things like that. Sorry, I can't be more specific. That is, oh, that was our final question. Uh, we've got a couple of them now. Um, from Craig, um, what about the SMPTE Universal Leader shown on the NASDAQ board? A very, very good, uh, very good call. Um, actually, I think it was an Academy Leader uh, that then got turned into the SMPTE Leader. Uh, maybe, Mark, you know a little bit more about this. Uh, no, um, the leader that I'm familiar with is the videotape leader, which I worked on the standardization of. Right, and I, did that come from the academy leader and then move into the videotape leader? Uh, no, the videotape leader was completely separate. Ah, gotcha. Okay, but good call on the on the leader. We now have a new digital leader, though, however, that's out there for HD and I think UHD as well too in the standard. So that uh, has morphed into the latest technology we have as well. Okay, and uh, Rick is uh, uh, doubling up here. He says, uh, were there any on double system sound film? And then he follows up with uh, separation of optical magnetic sound heads on single system audio. Boy, I'd, I'd have to ask Mark about that one again. These folks ask hard questions, don't they? Yeah, this is back to the film days. <laughs> well, uh, there was a standard for the uh, separation of the sound and picture, and um, I believe if you go to the convention in October, um, there is going to be a publication, and it will have a lot more information about that. Very good. Uh, I do not see any additional questions. Uh, uh, any closing comments? I take see every time I say that one pops up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this. We should call this uh, section of it "Stump the Standards." That's right, folks. Um, David David posted one. Um, if I recall correctly, the CBS project leading up to the CMX editors 
was called Rave Random Access Video Editor. Any of you recall that? Yeah, there were a bunch of interesting systems that were developed, um, and one that sort of led to the um, montage editing system involved multiple video cassette machines that could handle um, different segments or different scenes, and you could uh, be shuttling one while you were looking at another, and so it was sort of random access. But the, the CMX 600 was just an extraordinary development with these giant disk packs. The, the disk drive was about the size of a washing machine, um, but it did have the light pen technology and true random access. It was an amazing machine. And, and Mark, how much did that disk system hold at the time? Do you remember? I believe it was 28 minutes of black and white. And and how what was the size in in bytes? Do you know? Uh, that I can't remember, but it was not digital. It was um, I believe analog recording on the discs. Yeah, that was the the days I think when we were talking about kilobytes was humongous at those times. <laughs> Okay, well, we have one minute left, and the final comment comes from Stephen. He just wanted to remind us that ST 2016 Active Format Description was honored by an Emmy. And then, uh, let's see, uh, he also followed up the SMPTE time timecode and control code standard was based on work by ECO, E-E-C-O, and had a heritage in uh, toe iRig standards. Yep. So, thank you, Stephen. Uh, so gentlemen, can, go Joel, ahead. Can, can, uh, can you put the deck back up? There's one slide I wanted to put up and let people see if they recognize anybody. The Montreal Component Analog demo? Right. So, anybody know who this guy is? Boy, good question. Anybody know who this guy is? That looks learned like Larry Thorpe in a way. That is Larry Thorpe, very much in a way. <laughs> Phil, Phil Falcone said, yeah, Larry Thorpe. And this is Bernie Dayton. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this guy, you've seen once or twice. Yeah, I guess Merrill. Ah, memory lane. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Sig Heap says, uh, the Academy leader counts feet. The Simpty Universal leader counts seconds with a sweeping arm going around in a circle. The Simpty Universal Leader is fairly widely recognized in modern culture. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank our uh, speakers for uh, taking time to put together the presentation and to present. I'd also like to thank our guests for taking time. We, I know we spent another 90 minutes, or a long 90 minutes, and we still went over by a minute. Um, but uh, we'll wrap it up here. Um, hope to see you next time uh, on a SMPTE standards webcast or one of our monthly education webcasts. So thanks again. Take care. Safe travels. We'll see you next time.